I'm happy to say that Lachlan Williams in Bathory joins me now from Akaluit, Nunavut. Hi, how are you? I'm doing so well. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. You know, I've spoken so much with you about individual pieces that you've done. I've been looking forward to asking you this question. When did you start becoming an artist? Like, when does your journey to becoming an artist begin? Um, I would say it probably began when I was 13. Um, it, it started in uh, quite a sudden way, I would say, because my mother, as well as uh, another Greenlandic artist, um, decided to take me on as, as an apprentice in Wailnuk, and which basically meant, okay, like, look, this is what you do. You're going to do everything that we do. Here's 100 people. So <laughs> I started performing with them right away. <laughs> like a tri trial by fire. Yeah, exactly. Which is probably a really good thing for a while. And I, I understand that, like, you know, making art was, was good for you, I think, when you were growing up in, in Saskatchewan, right? Yeah, it was a really incredible uh, avenue for me to be able to not just express myself in a cultural way, but also uh, an individual way where I formed a lot of my uh, feminist uh, and um, sort of participatory and uh, collaborative political views. Uh, and also it was uh, a way of me being able to challenge what was the status quo in Saskatchewan, what is still the status quo in Saskatchewan. Um, there's such a virulent um, stream of racism that exists. And, and so I, I'm, well, actually, before I get to the next question, let's talk about Wyandotte for a second. Can you describe it for people or tell us about it for people who may not be familiar? Mm. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's uh, a mass dance that comes from Greenland. Uh, and it's a dance that existed in uh, pre-colonial times and exists in post-colonial times. So I like to say that it is uh, a dance that provides continuity to us as Inuit in Greenland. Um, and it didn't exist in colonial times because it is such a challenging performance. Um, and from the looks of it from the, the perspective of a missionary, a Lutheran minister from, from Norway, it looked very devilish. Uh, so it went underground for quite a long time. Uh, and so it is a, a black mask uh, made from soot and oil, and it has lines that are drawn through it so that you can see one's skin underneath and there's splashes of, of blood here and there. Um, nowadays, I use theater paint for all of that, but I have used uh, the traditional materials as well, which is a very uh, visceral experience. Um, and uh, so each of the components of the mask that is very, very idiosyncratic to each performer have uh, a set of symbols uh, that help the performer as well as the audience to uh, frame where we're going in, in uh, a dance and in a performance that's very improvised. We never know what's gonna come next. And it's all about the interaction between uh, humans and creatures, the surreal, the real, the spiritual, the, the, the gaudy, the, the uh, lewd. Uh, and it's an exploration of uh, fear, what it means to be in a state of fear and how performance actually provides everybody with a safe setting in order to do that exploration of fear. Um, and it is a celebration of sexuality. It sees each human being as their own expression, their uh, individual ownership of their own sexuality to respect yourself and respect everyone else. And then also it's a, it's a clown act. Um, you know, it's do everything to make it funny. It's in, in, and I, I speak as someone who has, has seen you do this a, a number of times and actually, uh, I'll say, maybe participated in, in it at one point as well <laughs> um, at, the, at the Polaris Prize. But I, I want to be careful with my words here, but it, it does feel like a transformation of you, like a look. You know, it does feel like, you know, I, you, know you and I have, have I've spent time socially and I, I've, you know, I, 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 I've got to know you a little bit. And then, you know, you become something else or you become a different version of yourself. And I wonder, mm -hmm. going back to what you were talking about when you were growing up around racism in Saskatchewan, 
I wonder if the ability to transform yourself into something else might have might have helped with that. Might have helped you deal with that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Maybe I should give a little bit of background as to why I grew up in Saskatchewan and have these Greenlandic roots, because that's odd. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, both my parents were uh, are professors at University of Saskatchewan. My mother is from Greenland, and my father was English, but spent a lot of his time here in Nunavut. So they brought the Arctic to Saskatchewan and gave me and my brother uh, our sense of culture through through our upbringing. Uh, but yeah, the, the ability to um, become the mask and also be behind the mask uh, was a, a very invigorating experience for me as a child, uh, as a teenager, and it still is, to be able to uh, observe humanity with a layer in front of me, but then also like take on this character and really be able to go right into people's spaces and ask what the heck is bothering you? How, how do you hold that within yourself? So yeah, that, that combination of being able to, to transform and then become a more visceral version of myself. I want to talk about a play called uh, Kinalik, These Sharp Tools that features uh, um, Wayonok. In 2012, you met the theater artist Evelyn Perry on an Arctic cruise traveling from Nunavut to Greenland. And I know you guys became good friends really, really quickly. Uh, I also know that you had a very different experience, each of you, on that cruise, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's really the crux of what uh, Ginalik B Sharp Tools are. Um, Evelyn came to the Arctic to do this uh, cruise for the first time. Uh, she had never been in this environment before. She'd never seen a landscape that didn't have trees. Uh, she'd never seen the tundra, the animals, the walrus and the bears and the seals popping in and out of the ocean. Uh, so she was literally drinking everything in minute by minute uh, throughout the day. And uh, I joined the expedition literally outside my, my back door here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going through a very, I'm going through Inuit homelands, uh, my own homelands, uh, and seeing everything that's happening on the expedition as this um, uh, social political arena where um, I can see inequality and uh, see all the different types of microaggressions and, and, uh, uneven relationships that play out daily between Inuit and non-Inuit here. So then you you work with one another. And one of the words that keeps coming up in, in your work with Evelyn is this idea of reconciliation. And when I read and, and I, I read into what you say about this, you differentiate between reconciliation and reckoning. And I wonder if you could mm. talk to that a little bit. Yeah, it's actually, we, we don't actually talk about reconciliation at all, but it's something that we get asked about yeah. uh, because we reject the idea that reconciliation is possible uh, because there are such huge disparities between um, the group that come from uh, the colonizing forces and the colonized here in the Arctic. So we do call Kinalik, these sharp tools, a, a reckoning. That, that same idea that comes from Wailnuk of about coming right to people and challenging them about who they are, what their views are. Uh, and we also say that Kinalik, these sharp tools, is uh, unresolved because we want people to leave with more questions than they came in with. And, and I think so often we want... Uh, uh especially, you know, colonizers, especially Southerners, want some kind of bow, you know what I mean? We want some kind of bow to tie up in. And that's often what we mean when we say reconciliation, which is, can we just, can we just tie this up? Like, can we just say, okay, right. well, that, we, we did it. It's, it's good. It, everything's good now, right? And I, mm-hmm. I find the idea of a reckoning as something that's, that will remain unanswered, but that's okay. Um, very, very interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's... Uh... It's also unsettling because uh, that's our, our our daily experience of colonization. You know, this past year I've had a cousin that's committed suicide. Uh, I, there's things that happen here in the streets of Akaluit that are are not reconcilable. There's not even conciliation about the things that happen here, be- directly because of co- uh, colonization. So to say that things are unresolved 
is not necessarily okay, but it is a challenge to us as performers and as audiences to be able to think about what is happening. When you say uh, our, uh, it's a responsibility for us or a challenge for us as performers and us as an audience, I, I find that interesting too. What's, what's the role of art in, in this reckoning? What's the, what's the role of art in this? Mm. Uh, all the artists that participate in creating uh, these sharp tools um, of course have intersectional identities um, and so to use art is like this this uh, it's basically like a, a, the platter that we're all able to put our various artistic practices and pieces of identity together and I find that um, when you use art to express yourself politically, uh, you basically offer yourself as a, you know, as a, I like seeing threads, you know, we've got the universe and we, we pull up threads, which are our identities. And the more that we pull up these threads, the more that people are able to see that they fit into this, this bigger picture of, of politics and, and uh, societal values and, and individual expression. If you're just tuning in, my guest is Luka Luke Williamson Bathory. We're talking to her about her multifaceted career. We're talking to her about building bridges through her work. We're just talking a little bit about, you know, the threads to the, all the other parts of our life that come up through art when it's performed. But I also know that you, you've said that Inuit don't exist in any capacity without uh, art and hunting, art and hunting, the two co core. I wonder if you could speak to the art side of that. Mm. Um, my father always told me that the, uh, the people that he uh, grew up with, that the people that he became a man with here in the Arctic would wake up every day and and not feel complete unless they had composed poetry about their lives, their daily lives. And uh, they would lie in the morning and think about the previous day and come up with a story or uh, a song and, and give it to the family. Um, and my mother comes from Greenland, which is a, a hugely artistically productive uh, country. And the art is really what led the social political movement that led to Greenlandic self-government. So uh, the creation of art is like breathing. It's like the stories, the myths, the, the relationship that we have with the land and water is an artistic relationship. And for me, that includes spirituality and the tangible experiences um, all in one. So it is the two things. I mean, right after this interview, uh, we're gonna hop on our boat and go on the big clam digging day. Everybody in Akhaluit is going clam digging today. So those are the two things that have always allowed us to exist through all the different eras that we've uh, faced. Is, is art and hunting. And, you know, the first time I spoke about your work, I spoke um, with Vinny Karatak about, about a, mm -hmm. a, a play that you had brought to Toronto. And, you know, one of the things he and I spoke about and one of the things that got a lot of attention was that the work was in Inuktitut, but it wasn't, uh, there wasn't a translation in... Uh, in, a, in a book, you know, there wasn't for Southern audiences, mm. for English audiences to, to read this and go, okay, that's, what, that's what's being said here. And we spoke a lot about that. And I know you and I spoke a lot about that uh, last time I was in Halloween. So I wonder if you could talk about language, you know, like how does your mm. relationship with language, how does your thoughts about language, how does language factor into your work? Mm. Um, I try very hard every day to uh, learn more in all the languages that I speak, but especially in Galatishud, which is Greenlandic. Uh, and it's not so hard in English because that's what all my education has been in. Uh, and it's language is like this, the force that allows us to be uh, communicative, that allows us to develop re relationships. Uh, and so I make a point of uh, being fully conversational with my children uh, and in Greenlandic, in, and they're three generations down from living full-time in Greenland. Uh, and it's entirely possible. I think that's one of the things that I find so exciting is that there are so many pressures for all of us as Indigenous people to give up our languages. And it has been forced out of so many of us through residential schools and, and even the current education system. But if you have an opening, you can work on 
growing that opening so that it becomes a passageway. Uh, I've been very blessed to be able to do that. And uh, mind you, you've also celebrated uh, the diversity within Inuit. You know, you've talked, uh, I'm, I'm talking mainly about your work, you know, Tulugak, uh, Inuit, Inuit Raven Stories, you know, as a collaboration, and, and a number of your collaborations are collaborations between Inuit artists from uh, the, across the Inuit diaspora. Mm. You know, through that collaboration, maybe this is sort of a big question, but through that collaboration, do you find that Inuit have more or less in common than you might have thought going in? <laughs> diaspora i've never heard it that way actually <laughs> uh, and well you know what i, I mean think, right you know what i'm you know what i mean well i mean it's not like we're uh running to various places because of uh because ah uh, yes uh, i never thought about that you, that use of it i was just i was yeah. trying to avoid the idea of thinking of it as a monolith you know right i see yeah you're probably right too <laughs> we're both right <laughs> <laughs> we can we can we can just leave now this is good <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, you know, the whole uh, stereotype of, of the Eskimo uh, that exists through uh, European popular culture and was very virulent through the Canadian um, colonial era really wants to see us all as these um, small, smiley, happy people that do what they're told. Uh, but in fact, we are uh, um, a very diverse uh, set of peoples. We have the same root language and we have a lot of the same cultural practices and we all have uh, this incredible connection to stories like the, the creation of the sun and the moon story exists for thousands and thousands of years in Alaska, just like it has in Greenland and all throughout Canada. We've got that kind of unity but we have so many different dialects. Um, in Arviat, where Vinnie Karadak and, and your other colleagues at CBC are from, there's five different dialects mm -hmm. in one community of a couple thousand people. Uh, yeah, so Dulugak, um, Inuit Raven Stories, um, the name of that play was a, a, a very um, big celebration of the fact that we have uh, such diversity and that it was a huge collaboration with with my friend Sylvia Cloutier and and all the different um, artists from Greenland from Nunavik um, which is just south of um, Nunavut just south of Baffin Island uh, and Nunavut we had um, I think around 15 artists from all different places all speaking their own specific dialects and all contributing their own stories in the celebration of our relationship between humans and ravens. How, how universal is the raven? Uh, it is completely universal. Um, I always like to say that in any community in the Arctic, there's, there's three species of animals. There's human beings, mm -hmm. there's dogs, and there's ravens. C can you tell me more about the raven? Mm. Uh, yeah, they're a very social creature. Mm -hmm. They're extremely intelligent. Um, a few years ago, my neighbor uh, caught one in a trap by accident. Um, and I went outside and there was about 50 ravens all swarming around this injured raven on the ground. And that's when I realized that uh, they, they, have, they have families and clans and they mourn and they do ceremony like a funeral. Um, and so I was so curious about why they were all doing that. And so I asked a few questions. And sure enough, they have this entire culture of their own uh, and probably lots of dialects like Inuit. But uh, they're also very attracted to our waste. Um, they, they, if you go to the dump here, mm -hmm. uh, it's entirely covered with ravens picking at shiny things and eating disgusting things. I, I want to talk to you so about... They're, so, sorry, they're kind of like a reflection of our... Ravens are kind of like a reflection of who we are as humans. That's, I mean, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know about the sort of like the funereal uh, way that like the, the sort of the mourning ravens uh, around a dead raven. That's, mm. that's quite, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of still kind of coping with that as you, after you said it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, can we, I want to talk, I don't want to take up too much of your time because I also want you to go get your clams. But earlier this year, mm. the Art Gallery of Ontario announced that it's acquired one of your pieces called Sila Patunga in another collaboration 
this time with a video artist named Jamie Griffiths. Can you tell me about that piece? Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, it's um, it's the contribution that Jamie and I made to uh, an exhibition originally uh, that I co-curated at Art Gallery of Ontario called Dunakosiyangit, which is a celebration of Kinuaiwa Ashivak and Tim Bitsiula. So we got commissioned to to make this piece and it translates to the whole in the universe. Uh, and basically it is, um, it's a giant screen that hangs down from the ceiling and is pushed up from the floor. So it looks like it's floating. Um, and you can walk around it and see the same film on both sides. So it has this magical quality of uh, kind of being universal with sound all around. And Silao Putunga is an exploration of that thing that we were talking about just earlier of, of both being the mask and being behind the mask and being able to peel through layers of reality and the surreal um, and what exactly is possible through that exploration. What, what I find interesting about that is yeah, that is what we started talking about. But when we were talking about it at the beginning, we were talking about you. We were talking about you as yourself, you know, when you uh, when you sort of transform and who you are and who you are behind the mask and who you are outside the mask. But if you really think about it, everything we've talked about since in terms of your artistic output has been a collaboration. It's been a collaboration with, with other Inuit. It's been a collaboration with Southerners. has been collaborative. What what? I mean, it's, it's sort of a basic question, but what do you get? Why, why do you seek out collaboration? I think uh, collaboration is one of the, um, the highest uh, things that I can achieve as an artist uh, because it not only emphasizes the, the end result, but the process. It's all about relationship. Uh, and f- this focus on, on relationship and process goes to show that uh, that it is possible to create things that are interesting and valuable uh, uh, that are outside of capitalism and are outside of patriarchy, uh, that are uh, about respecting yourself as an artist and, and the contribution that you're making and respecting what the other collaborators are bringing in so that we're making a new whole. Uh, I find that to be... Um, the, a true feminist expression and also uh, a, a true non-capitalist um, equality creating uh, way of making art. And the, the idea of that when, when we work with one another, when we are with one another, it's something that's not bound by commerce. It's something that no one actually has any control of except for the person you're with. And, and there's something yeah. very beautiful, something very spiritual about that. In, in, in essence at all, just talking to somebody, just working with somebody. I, mm-hmm. I, I love that. L- luckily, I have to tell you, I mean, before we started the interview, I started by telling you that I've been very jealous of your Instagram because, you know, I, as, as, as I am missing my home and I'm missing going out of the water and I'm, I'm missing, you know, uh, you know be, being out of the city, um, I've been on your Instagram and, and sort of feeling very sad that I can't, you know, go out and have the, the, the lovely time with your family that you're having. That being said, being the creative person that you are, I know this pandemic has not been easy on creative people. Um, even though you have the time, it's sometimes hard in this darkness to find the motivation. How are you doing staying creative during this? Mm, I have three kids. And so a lot of my activity uh, over the past six months or more has been very child oriented. Uh, and uh, what I find is that, you know, I have so much family that I'm missing as well. Um, uh, and there's actually no way of us uh, as artists coming down to the South uh, like we used to because we have a two-week quarantine barrier between uh, Nunavut and the rest of Canada. Uh, so I find that I have to make the best and, and it's giving me this deep meditation time. So, for example, earlier this summer, uh, my five-year-old and I had uh, – at a ginguk garden, we call it. Ginguk is sea lice or krill in English. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it's just like mind-blowing how much krill there is here in the Khaluit. So we take our fish bones from the fish that we would uh, uh, catch in our nets 
and then go down into the low tide zones and put the the uh, fish there and then watch them get completely devoured. Like you could hear the krill moving around and chewing at, at the bones. And then afterwards, oh, I'm wearing one of them right now. <laughs> they make jewelry out of the, the bones that were completely eaten up by, by the gingoks. So, you know, combining this delightful activity with a five-year-old, with making pretty things, and then uh, thinking about how Inuit in Greenland have these stories of lands like this that are infested by seal lice, seal ice, seal lice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I've been working on, uh, just pulling in as many tangible experiences into uh, to creating new things that are that are going to be very useful for me in this brand new world. I, I can't wait to see what you come out of this uh, old world with. I can't wait to see what, uh, what what's, what's next for you. And um, I always love talking to you. And I have to say, you know, we kind of went into this thing about your idea of how you're able to, to build bridges between people. And, you know, even just going back to what we were just talking about a second ago, the idea that co- the collaboration, that that bridge building is something that humans can actually do with one another, that people try to control, but they can't that it's something much deeper and something much more richer than anything that might be part of our sort of colonial institutions is, is very meaningful for me. And, um, mm. and I, I think really speaks to it. So I, w- I want to thank you for your time. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>